Hey guys, how are ya? How are ya? Let me see. I think maybe that's gonna be too much. <laughs> What's happening, everybody? Second session for today. I don't know if we're gonna get the same amount of people, but the Lord Jesus be glorified as will be done. Now, it may buffer, but in Jesus' name, the buffering will go away because the connection is much better than it used to be. Is it me? What's up, Jeremy? What's up, buddy? Lord bless you. Lord bless every one of you. <clears throat> is it me or do I look older? I don't look heavier, do I? Anyway. All right. Welcome. We'll wait a few more minutes. And what I'll do is, Lord Jesus willing, I'll even open up. Yep. Sorry, like I said, it's going to buffer for a few minutes, but the buffering should be okay. It's going to go away. Just be patient. Don't TikTok time and don't panic. The connection is 99% better than what it used to be, but for some reason it buffers once in a while. So don't panic, folks. We'll trust, right? Hopefully, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I'll open up for Q&A in the last 10 minutes. I'll open up my Skype. It worked wonders today. So welcome, and Jeremy, God bless you, your household. The Lord bless all of you, all your households, your spouses, your children, your parents, siblings, whoever. Uh, I don't know what you mean. No, it's not. East Coast right now is 10 p.m. That's New York time. Where I'm at, it's... No, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. It's 11 o'clock p.m. in New York. I apologize, guys. Sorry about that. See, I'm, I miss... The change of time zones confused me. Yes, it's 8 p.m. my time. 11 p.m., East Coast time. I had told people 10 p.m. East Coast time, uh, and it's 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. These time zones, man, my goodness. Can't we just stay all on the same time? Sorry, but even though it's a late nighter, I know, man, I made a mistake. I said 10, but that's okay. You know what, folks? Put it this way. You guys aren't working anyway. Hopefully the buffering won't be bad. It'll get better. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Just wait for a few minutes. It should get much better. I don't know. But today it's buffering a little more than usual. But don't forget, get ready. By next week, the government's going to tell us stay home. There'll be no work. So they're going to keep us at home, quarantined for a while. And that's why the president is trying to get our rent or mortgages <clears throat> postponed. So they don't collect for at least a month. Give us some relief because there's no money coming in. I don't think you will have any job for at least a month. God bless you guys. Thank you for your support, Mendez. God bless you. I just got to now collect from the super chat. So it's coming, but this is where you need to shine for Jesus Christ. This is where you need to glorify Jesus Christ. I know. And pray for the nurses. Pray for Lori. Pray for Marcy, pray for the doctors, healthcare providers, because they're going to be in the midst of the battle. Even the military is going to be called in. Yeah, military is going to be called in. There's going to be martial law, folks, but don't panic. This is where you got to be salt of the earth and light of the world and show them the difference between trusting in Jesus, who is alive, who is almighty, who is real. He's almighty over creation, almighty over coronavirus, and he will give us grace, sustain us. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid and don't shame Jesus Christ. Do not shame Jesus Christ because we're not paying lip service to him. The Bible is real. The God of the Bible is real. He is almighty. He is in control. He'll, he will usher us into his presence and he will return to the earth and transform it in the day that he's appointed for his glory. We just endure Pray the Spirit fill us and keep us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Because historically, Christians have gone through much worse. Christians have died of various plagues in the past. Christians have been tortured, beheaded, flailed, imprisoned, burned. Even now as we speak, there have been Christians who have been beheaded, beaten to death, enslaved. Christian women and children enslaved, women raped, <clears throat> in prison. So... And yet they still love Jesus, they still glorify Jesus, and they don't deny Jesus. Shame on us if we panic and bring shame to Christ. Shame on us. So don't do it. Don't shame the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not dishonor the Lord. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. May he seal me, seal all of you, preserve us to glorify Jesus Christ in the way we live, conduct ourselves in a time of panic, and even in our death to glorify him. And I ask the Lord Jesus just to preserve us and my daughters, my angels, to flood them, flood all of you, your children, your elderly, <clears throat> siblings, spouses, you name it, flood us, Father. Flood us, Lord Jesus. Flood us, Holy Spirit, in your infinite love, your compassion, your mercy. Father, bless this session as you did the previous session. Guide this conversation. Strengthen the internet connection, Father. You don't need me. We need you. <clears throat> Use these resources to bring us closer to you, Father, to bring us closer to one another, to pray more now, to fast more, to study scripture more, to fellowship more. And the Jesus Christ will increase in us so we decrease. Cover us by the blood of Jesus. Our loved ones, my daughters, cover them by the blood of Jesus. Seal us, seal them by your Holy Spirit and fill us for the glory of Jesus. You will never leave nor forsake us. And you'll give us the grace to endure anything. If that means going to prison for you, Father. <clears throat> Getting the coronavirus. <clears throat> Whatever it is, Father. <clears throat> you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. And you'll give us the grace to endure to never betray you or deny you. And Father, I ask that you bless this session. Grant me clarity of thought and speech. Save me from error. Fill my chest, my lungs, my throat with the breath of life and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your children, Father, to the spiritual body of Christ. And by your Holy Spirit, use me to bless them, to be more in love with Jesus because we can't love him enough. Sit and throne upon our hearts, Father, upon our hearts, Lord Jesus, upon our hearts, Holy Spirit, and even the hearts of our loved ones. In my case, my daughters, even their mother, Use this time to bring even their mother to the feet of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Praise God. In the first session, we had about 175 people. Live q and I open up my Skype channel. Lord willing, <clears throat> before I finish the session, I'll open up for about 10 minutes maybe. Lord willing, I'll open up my Skype so you can call me and ask your question. So that session's archived. And as you see, I'm, I'm doing two sessions today. Why? Because we're going to be doing nothing but sitting home, <clears throat> Ugh, this uh, tart, sitting home because we won't be able to go to work. The government's going to come in and tell us stay home. They'll take care of stuff. And so now we have to make the most of the time. We don't waste time. We won't use the internet for sin or indulge our sinful passions. We're going to be using this time. Flesh, Lord. Yeah, I Man, I get angry when it gets buffering. I want to, like, just destroy the computer. But in Jesus' name, it's going to stay strong. We're going to pray more, study scripture more, come online and use the Internet lawfully for the glory of Christ. <clears throat> so that's why I decided to do the second session. The buffering will go away by the grace and mercy of the Lord. It's 99% better than before. Okay. First and last, are you here or you disappeared again? I don't know what happened to this brother. Oh, boy. Oh, you got it, brother. I didn't know that. Okay, folks, we don't know. I don't know if we're going to get the regular 150 we get because it's kind of later than normal. But that's okay. They can watch it as it's archived. <clears throat> more foreshadowings of Christ. Okay. Again, I just want to wait a few more minutes because the buffering, you know, eventually disappears by the grace of the Lord. Hey, DJ, God bless you. God bless every one of you. All right. Let's do this. We're going to talk about foreshadowings of Christ. If you haven't listened to the previous sessions, you need to, because I laid the foundation from the scriptures that God has inspired the Old Testament, and he has designed <clears throat> Old Testament history. Because God is sovereign. He's the Lord of creation. He is almighty over creation. He oversees creation, and he works in creation in such a way to guide people and events to be a picture of Jesus Christ to come. Do you remember that? You remember that session? I did at least two parts on this. You guys remember, right? Before I move on? So that the entire Old Testament becomes a picture, a painting of Jesus. The prominent figures of the Old Testament, these are true historical events, events that truly took place, true historical persons that lived. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the tribes, David, they were all <clears throat> moved by God's spirit in such a way that they experienced things that becomes a picture of Jesus Christ to come. Are you with me there? That's why I say foreshadow. It's all pointing to Jesus Christ. 
And in the previous sessions, I showed you. That's why I got to go back and re-listen because I can't just repeat the same thing over again, even though I do try to repeat something more than once, once until it becomes second nature. No, Daily Night, it's not. So I do try to repeat something often until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's Spirit, but I don't want to keep repeating stuff that I've already covered in depth. So go back, re listen, and re-listen, and re-re-listen until it becomes second nature. Okay. Yeah, June, don't misapply uh, scripture to suggest that people who are believers or love Jesus won't get the coronavirus. Don't be that naive. Jesus never said we won't get diseases, and I covered that in the previous session. The day session, I covered that. You guys got to go listen to it. What Jesus says, in spite of what you experience, whether it's cancer, whatever it is, he'll give you the power, the joy, the confidence, the hope, the reassurance that the Holy Spirit is with you till the end. If that means he'll heal you, may he be glorified. If you die, may he be glorified. Because, you see, if you have an eternal perspective, if you guys really believe Christ is risen, and we who die physically, our spirits leave our bodies, and we're consciously alive in the presence of Jesus, you're going to a place that's more alive. Believers who die become pain-free, disease-free, <clears throat> No more misery, no more depression, no more anguish, no more problems, if, if you believe. But if it's a said faith, lip service, where you're just pretending to believe, then that means your hope is in this life because you don't really believe there's an afterlife. So may Jesus give us the power to believe that without any doubt whatsoever. Thank you, Dominus Telcom. Your mom was a godly woman who loved Jesus and Jesus loved. She's now more alive in Christ. So this nonsense about, hey, you know, you ain't going to get disease. You're going to have to die until the Lord comes. So God has designed and permitted the way you're going to die. It's like Nabil Qureshi, just a side note. Nabil Qureshi, so-called false prophets told him, God won't let you die. This cancer. He's going to heal you and take you a higher level. And then he died. Do you know that? He died then. So what about those so-called prophets that said God spoke to them? If they're living under an Old Testament theocracy, they'd be stoned and killed, giving them false hope, right? Now, people think that Nabil wasn't cured of his cancer, right? He wasn't cured of his cancer, right? No. This is, again, showing that our perspective is wrong. He was cured of his cancer because God can cure you of cancer in two ways. Either heal your cancer, the cancer now in this physical body or heal you of your cancer by taking you out of this body so you're cancer-free and your body returns to the dust until Jesus returns and resurrects your body and glorifies it. He has been healed of cancer completely. Cancer can never touch him again. That's if you have a heavenly perspective, an everlasting perspective. But if you're only thinking this world, this body, oh, God didn't heal him. He really, you sure? He's not completely healed where cancer can never touch him ever again. That is true healing. And then when Christ returns, he will then reconstruct, resurrect, recreate his physical body to become immortal, indestructible. That's if you believe. And you have to believe because Christ is risen. He's real. Whether we believe it or not, he is God. He's real. Okay? So you everyone with me there? So I'm going to encourage you. It's going to get a little worse. Do not panic. Do not disgrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Maintain your integrity and your faith. Be a difference. Where people's panicking, they see you calm. Why are you calm? Because Jesus is alive. He's almighty over coronavirus. And if you're in love with him, he will give you grace not to be afraid. <clears throat> right? Everyone with me there? Just want to make sure. With that said, we're going to talk about how Old Testament events become pictures of Jesus Christ, if you're ready. In Jesus' name, Lord, rebuke the buffering, if you're ready. It's getting better. Hopefully, in Jesus' name, it gets better and better. Ah, 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 I hate when it buffers. It's like I want to lose my testimony and just destroy destroy the camera. Yes, again, I said pray for the nurses, and I mentioned Marcy Lynn. Marcy Lynn is a nurse. She's working in the hospital. She's going to be in contact with people with the coronavirus. So pray for the nurses. She loves Jesus Christ, but she has cancer. With cancer and a weakened immune system, she's there bold, full of life, full of joy, and not afraid. 
a testimony to us. So pray for her, bathe her in prayers, and all the nurses and doctors. Because don't forget, they're exposing themselves to this as well. Right? So pray for Marcy Lynn. Pray for the nurses like Lori. Yep, she's a warrior. With cancer, weakened immune system, she's not afraid. She laughs it off because she knows her Lord is alive. Right? Okay. So is that clear? All right. Okay, let's talk about how the Old Testament becomes a picture of Christ. Let me remind you that the Bible tells us the Old Testament is a picture of Christ. So let's look at what the Bible says about Adam. Is he a picture of Christ? Romans 5, 14. Let's begin. Louisa, good to see you, sister. You guys, if you are listening attentively, you will be blessed and blown away by this. <clears throat> Romans 5, 14. Speaking of Adam, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. Now pay attention, folks. Try to keep side talk to a minimum so you can focus because I want you to learn. I want you to be in awe of the Bible because the more you see how deep and beautiful and supernatural the Bible is, the stronger you will be in your faith that the God of the Bible is real and the promises of the Bible are true. You can take God at his word, right? This will be your anchor, the scriptures, because the scriptures are the voice of God. Let me show you that real quickly before I show Adam as a picture of Christ. Let me show you why we need to study the scriptures, because the scriptures are God's voice to his sheep to comfort them. Okay, let me show you. Are you guys ready? Because I need your attention. Matthew 22, 31 to 32. What does our Lord say about the scriptures? And here he quotes Exodus 3, verse 6. Exodus 3, verse 6. He quotes it to the Sadducees. Okay. Okay, Matthew 22, 31 to 32. Watch here. But as touching the resurrection, pay attention, guys, to what the Lord says. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken? Yeah, Adam, Sheikha, please, Father, rebuke the buffering Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Rebuke Satan. Please, Lord, I get upset when it buffers. But thank God it's 99% better than what it used to be. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. First of all, thank you, brother, first and last, for helping us, helping me to help them and serve them. Lord bless you richly and keep you healthy for his glory. But guys, let me quote Matthew 22, 31 again. Not right now, daily. I'll open it up within the last 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Not now. When I'm teaching a session, I can't be distracted. Focus, please. Guys, pay attention. The Lord's quoting Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, which was written 1,500 years before this conversation. When Jesus is having this conversation with the Sadducees, he's quoting Exodus, which was written by Moses, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, about 1,500 years before. But you guys aren't paying attention. Pay attention. Because if you're paying attention, you would see it. But you're not. So pay attention so you can see it. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, See, you didn't catch it. Jesus is telling the Sadducees, every time you read Exodus 3, verse 6, God is speaking to you. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God? You know when you read the Old Testament, God is speaking to you. He's saying these things to you. Did you catch it? Jesus equated reading the Bible or hearing the Bible read as God speaking to you. God speaking to you. Did you see that? That's why I say got to pay attention. If you're not paying attention, you're not going to see it. He just said, when you Sadducees read the Old Testament, like Exodus 3, you know God is speaking to you, right? He's not just speaking to Moses. He's speaking to you. You catch it? And that's true of the, all the scriptures that God read out. So the question is, why do we read the Bible? We read the Bible to hear from our God who loves us, who's in love with us, to know what he has to say to us, to reassure us, to comfort us, to, to give us a peace that transcends all understanding. Now, let me give you another reference. Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. <clears throat> okay. Jesus again speaking. He's speaking, our Lord, who is God in the flesh, who inspired the scriptures by the Spirit. 
And he answered and said unto them, have you not read? Notice reading something. Have you not read? And he's going to quote Genesis 127 and Genesis 224. He's going to quote Genesis 127 and Genesis 224. Okay. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, so the creator said, for this cause shall a man be father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and that they twain shall be one flesh. He just quoted Genesis 2.24 and said that God said that. God said that. So have you not read what God said? See, when you read, God is speaking. He's saying something to you so you can learn. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So we read the Bible to hear from our Father, to hear from His Son, our Lord Jesus, to hear from the Holy Spirit, to hear their word, to tell us what to do, what not to do, and to hear their promises and assurance and their love for us, to strengthen us so we are not afraid. Okay, Romans 15, verse 4. Romans 15, verse 4. Right? Is it making sense to you guys now? Why you got to cherish the Bible? Why the world... Inspired by Satan, attacks the Bible and tries to destroy your faith in the Bible. Notice why God gave you the scriptures. Guys, read Romans 15, 4. Why were these things written in the Old Testament? Why are these things written in the New Testament? Why did God record these historical events? Here, Romans 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, the things that are written in the past, were written for our learning. Our learning that through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Did you catch it? These events were recorded by God for our learning so that we can learn to be patient on God and be comforted that just like the men and women of God before us who went through hell but were preserved by God alive. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus, our Lord, rebuked this book. All right. What are you going to do, man? There's not much I can do. But anyway, see, notice at a very salient point, it goes out. Now, again, what Romans 15, 4 is saying is when you see the examples of the people of God, what they went through, exile, captivity, persecution, and yet God preserved them to never lose faith, that should then comfort you and reassure you. That Sorry, guys. Notice every time that I say the same God, it goes out because Satan is angry, but the blood of Jesus, Jesus has destroyed you. See, notice every time, every time I'm talking about the same God, it goes out because. All right. Sorry about that. We'll see. Now let's see. Okay. Yep. We'll wait a few more minutes. See? Anyway, what are you going to do? I don't know, maybe it's high activity, too many people. Anyway, folks, we'll just, you know, like I said, notice every time I want to say the same God, same God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, anyway, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, your will be done. You are God. In Jesus' name, you want me to teach, we'll teach. If not, we'll shut down. Anyway, what are you going to do? Oh, boy. We'll just wait a few more minutes. Right? Isn't it amazing every time? Man, dude, I look old. And... Anyway, I'm afraid to say anything anymore. Can you guys hear me or no? Okay, I don't know what's going to happen. This is very bad today. Uh, I'm probably going to quit Cox eventually. Cox uh, provider, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know, is it the high volume? Maybe people are... Hmm. Okay. There you go. It's very bad today. Mm-hmm. Yep, too bad, right? It wasn't this bad earlier. No, we had bad rain earlier, but I don't know.
Yeah, I don't know, folks. If the Lord doesn't want me to teach, that's fine. It was it was b uh, raining bad, real bad here. Okay, good. No, it's going to probably buffer. We'll wait a few more minutes. Yeah, I know, right? It was 99% better, but we'll wait. Let's say I don't know. Every time, so you notice that Romans 15.4 caused, like, disruption. Right? I'm even nervous to continue. Let's see, guys. Just wait. Let's see. Let's see what happens. I mean, earlier was pretty good. I don't know. It was looking good for a while, but hopefully, I don't know. Yachi, yachi. All right, in Jesus, almighty name. Poor, when we were up to 70, we lost some snow, Sam. Most likely it's going on. We'll be back tonight. That's beautiful, Niles. That's beautiful. But then it's almost over. Beautiful. Too bad I don't have my daughters. They're not with me. Okay, guys, uh, let's try. If it, it messes up, messes up. It has been raining bad outside, real bad weather. So it was thunder. So let's see what happens. Okay, anyway, as I was saying, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord doesn't need me to teach. We can shut it down. We'll see. But I said Romans 15, 4, not to lose the point. Let's look at Romans 15, 4 one more time so we can begin. We're going to begin. For whatsoever things were written aforetime in the past were written for our learning. Guys, focus now. Regroup and focus in Jesus' name. Aforetime were written for our learning that through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now understand what he's saying. The past events that are recorded in the Old Testament and now in the New Testament for us were given to comfort us and teach us to be patient and endure and not lose hope. Because we see that men of God, women of God, mightier men of God and women of God than me, went through trials and tribulations and testing. Some of them were beaten. Some were even died, died as martyrs, right? <clears throat> In prison, exiled from their lands. And yet none of them lost their faith because God preserved them, preserved them to maintain integrity and faithfulness. And so the scriptures teach you the same God who did that for them is the same God who's on the throne now. He's king over creation and loves you just as much as he loved them and won't abandon you like he didn't abandon them and will preserve you like he preserved them. And that preservation may mean he will preserve you as you go to prison. He'll give you the grace to go through it and not cave in. He'll preserve you if you get coronavirus. He will preserve you and will never allow you to be destroyed by your circumstances so the scriptures are given to give you that assurance so you can be comforted and not lose hope. You get it? So again, go read the Bible and see what the men of God and women of God have gone through. Imprisonment, torture, martyrdom. Yet in all of that, they were more than conquerors because nothing that life threw at them destroyed their faith in Jesus because Jesus was almighty to preserve them. Okay? So now this is the time for us to be vessels in the hands of God. So if history is written about the coronavirus, there'll be men and women who will testify. The Christians shined with the glory of Jesus. Nothing scared them. Nothing fazed them. And many of them went out there and helped the elderly and helped people in need not afraid of getting coronavirus. And with coronavirus, they overcame and never denied Jesus. Okay? This is our time to shine for the glory of Jesus. Shame on us if we panic and we lose hope and disgrace the name of Jesus. Then what difference, what distinction is there between unbelievers and us? You got Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists who are showing faith and confidence in their gods and goddesses that don't exist, putting us to shame, right? And we have the true God. So may God give us grace to shine for his glory no matter what happens, all right? Is that clear? So I just want to let you know, that's why during this time of being quarantined, pray more. Time to fast. You see now why fasting is beneficial. Now, let me tell you the practical benefits of fasting. Now, you don't fast for practical benefits. You fast as a sacrifice for the Lord. You show, Lord, I'm going to sacrifice my fleshly needs and wants and desires 
to show you I love you more than my flesh and my desires. So you fast as an act of sacrifice. But now notice the benefit of fasting. When you fast, your body purges itself, right? This is a fact, a medical fact. So there's that benefit. But when you fast, you learn to control your appetite and not be controlled by your appetite so that in times of scarcity, you can get away and get along with less food. Do you see how everything that God gives you is for your benefit at the long run? That act of fasting, God doesn't need my fast. But my fast is an act of worship saying, God, I love you more than my desires. But now notice the benefit of fasting. Now God gives you self-control. Discipline. So you're not controlled by your passions and appetites. You now control them so that now you can go without food for three days or four days or five days and still be energized by the Spirit. Right? You see the benefit? And God willing, in time, God willing, in time, I will go through the benefits of these commands. I will go through the benefits of these commands. And by the way, is Sister Luisa here? So I'll make sure she's benefiting too. Yeah. Anyway, let me let me let me give you let me give you another example, another benefit, another benefit, right? Of God's command for us that although on the surface seems like it's not beneficial, it actually is. Let me talk about premarital sex. Why is God against premarital sex? Pay attention now. Don't get into side talks where you get distracted. Focus. Why? The reason why God says you are not to touch a woman or a man because the only type of intimacy that God honors is someone who's born male, male gender, a female born female in gender, come together in holy matrimony as husband and wife and are monogamous. Now, why does God say do not touch anyone until you get married? Let me show you the benefit. This is a fact. I want you to prove me wrong, okay? Listen to me. I want you to prove me wrong. I want you to go out there and research on Chef Google. Everything is not on the internet, and not everything is reliable on the internet, but there is still reliable information. Notice the result of permitting premarital sex. Notice the result of that, the effects of it. You now have people who are starting to be sexually intimate in grammar school, and by the time they get to in their 30s and marry, they've been through multiple partners. And when you've been through multiple partners, it's very hard to commit to anyone because you've been used to sleeping with whom you want. And when things don't go right, abandon ship and go find someone else to shack, shack up with. So that commitment <clears throat> is gone because why? What's the foundation of your relationship? Sex. Whereas if you do it God's way, the foundation of your relationship is not sexual intimacy. It's you two getting to know each other and falling in love with the person, right? And becoming inseparable from that person, loving the person and not loving the sex that you are engaging with the person because that sexual desire, that intimacy will wear out and then there's no foundation to keep you because now you see you're not compatible. Right? Because what brought you together was sexual intimacy. And when that sexual intimacy dies out because the eye man is never satisfied, there's nothing to sustain you because there's no foundation, no connection. Now you start saying, man, I'm not compatible with this person. This person's not compatible with me. Man, the things I used to like in this person, I can't stand. Because why? Your foundation was sexual intimacy. Whereas if you do it God's way, you get to know each other. You get to become friends. And you get to fall in love with that person and all their idiosyncrasies and their quirks. And then sex is the gift that you give to each other now that you become <clears throat> truly friends and get to know the person and love the person for that person, not because of jumping in bed, right? You get my point? And that's, I'm not just saying it. Look around you. Look around you. Look at how many failed marriages because the two people, when they come together, already had a long history of sexual <clears throat> encounters with multiple partners that now makes it hard for them to be committed 
because <clears throat> sexual intimacy can only last so long. If there is no bond between the persons, loving the person for that person, and not simply because of jumping in bed with them, and if Christ is not at the center, it's bound to fail. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Right? So again, everything is for our benefit by the grace of God. Right? Everything is for our benefit by the grace of God. He doesn't give commands because he wants to punish us and he's cruel and wants to make our life miserable. That's not it. Love Sam. Sister, I don't know if you're a sister or brother. What do you mean the right thing? You pray to God, trust in God to bring you the right person, and that right person is going to love Jesus more than he or she loves themselves and you. And then you get to know the person, <clears throat> pray with the person, study the Bible with the person, evangelize with the person. So your bond will be Christ, the center of your relationship, and now falling in love with the person. And then sex becomes the gift that you give to each other after you've come <clears throat> to fall in love with each other because you both love Jesus. In other words, if I see that you're in love with Jesus, if I see that you're in love with Jesus, that's going to draw me to you because I want someone who's going to love Jesus more than anything. I don't want someone who doesn't have Jesus in their life. I don't want to even get near that person because if they don't love Jesus, they can't love me. Because when you love Jesus, you're going to love me for the sake of Jesus. You're going to honor me for the sake of Jesus. You're going to do right before me for the sake of Jesus. But if there's no Jesus, why should you love me or honor me, honor me or make me happy? It's all going to be about you, me, me, me. You make me happy. You don't make me happy to hell with you. I'm going to go find someone else. Right? But if it's because of Jesus... It's not about whether this person makes me happy. It's whether I'm making Jesus happy by honoring this person. And then when you find someone has the same mentality, you're going to have a taste of heaven on earth. Right? You're going to have a taste of heaven on earth. Let me repeat again. If the husband and wife are in love with Jesus and they love Jesus more than themselves and anything else, both parties then will honor the other for the sake of Jesus. So if my wife pushes my buttons, I'm going to bite my tongue because I know, Lord Jesus, you're going to be angry if I lash out. Likewise. Likewise. She's going to say the same thing. I better not cause him to stumble because if he stumbles and sins, the Lord's going to be angry with me. So I better bite my... So both of you are going to honor, respect each other because you don't want to anger each other and grieve Jesus because you love him and his feelings count above yours. You with me there? Let me give you an example of what the Bible says about a husband who causes his wife to stumble. Causes his wife to stumble. 1 Peter 3, verse <clears throat> 7. 1 Peter 3, verse 7, as the Lord enables me to recall scriptures for his glory. And then we're going to begin. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Likewise, you husbands, pay attention here. Dwell with them according to knowledge. The knowledge that God has given you to teach you how to dwell with them. Okay. Giving honor unto the wife. Honor her as unto the weaker vessel. Physically and emotionally. In many ways, she's emotionally stronger than you. But in many ways, she's weaker. And physically, she's fragile. As being heirs together, she's your heir. You both are heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may, may be not hindered. Did you catch it? Notice the warning. If you cause your wife to stumble then your prayers will be hindered because God won't ha answer your prayers because you have offended your wife. Did you catch it? Did you catch what it said, husbands? One of the reasons that your prayers are not being heard is because of the way you treat your wife. So now if you love the Bible, 1 Peter 3, 7, post it again. If you love the Bible because it's God's voice and you love God and God told you, hey, listen, listen, Young man, that is my daughter, purchased by the blood of my son, filled with the Spirit. I love her just as much as I love you. I don't love you more than her. When you hurt my daughter, you hurt me. 
So do you love me? Make her happy. And then likewise to his daughter. That's my son. Purchased by the blood of Jesus. And the spirit of my son is in him. When you hurt him and offend him and cause him to stumble, you ache my heart. So do you love me? Stop hurting him. You, got, you catch it now? The problem in marriages is when one party or both becomes self-centered, selfish, and it's about how I feel. This person doesn't make me happy, and I deserve to be happy, damn it. Or this person doesn't satisfy me, and I deserve to be satisfied, damn it. See, if it's me, 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 it's not going to last. If it's him, 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 it will endure and last. Okay, is that clear? Is that clear? Just want to make sure. So understand these commands are for your benefit. These commands are not to hurt you. And is it a coincidence that people who are monogamous relationships don't get sexually transmitted diseases? Is it a coincidence those who are sexually active get sexually transmitted diseases? I wonder why. Hmm, I wonder why. Why is it monogamous relationships, husbands and wives who have been faithful to each other, who don't cheat, don't get sexually transmitted diseases, but those who are sexually active get diseases like it's going out of style. HIV, gonorrhea, you name it. I wonder why. Hmm. Because this is the consequences of not tr trusting the creator of your body to know what's best for your body. Do you know that? This is the consequences of not trusting the creator of your body to know what's best for your body and knows what's best for your mental health. Right? Another drawback of too many sexual partners. When you've had too many sexual partners, there's always the temptation to compare one partner with the other. Yeah, but he wasn't like that guy, or she he wasn't she wasn't like that girl. Right? Man, you know the way she used to kiss me, but you know, it's not the same like when she's you see. You're always going to be comparing. And when you do that, you dishonor the one you're with, right? And belittle them. See? See, love Sam and Lee, she's, she's honest and saying, see, I went through that. And folks, I'm not trying to appeal to pity, pity party, so don't think I'm appealing to pity. You know what I had to endure for 10 years? And pray for her. Michelle is the mother of my daughters. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on her and forgive her for what she did. And heal my heart. Because if I don't check my heart, I can get angry. You know what I used to hear for 10 years? I don't love you. I'm not attracted to you. I'll never be attracted to you. And then she would compare me to her other boyfriends. So finally, I just didn't care anymore. And we became roommates. So, okay. I can't, I can't be intimate with someone like that. That's what I did for 10 years. Yes, I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not trying to make her look bad because she's damaged. She's fallen and tainted by the devil unless the Lord delivers her. But pray for my heart so I don't focus on those words, so I don't end up hating but feeling sorry and compassion for her. Yep, 10 years. I'm not lying to you. I don't love you. I never loved you. I felt forced to be in this marriage, right? I'll never be attracted to you. And then when she wanted to really hurt me, she'd compare me to other guys. Okay? So this is the setback of not doing it Jesus' way. Okay? This is what happens when you don't do it Jesus' way. But when you don't have multiple partners and you haven't been with people except the one you're with, who are you going to compare her to? Who is she going to compare you, compare you with? She hasn't been with anyone. You haven't been with anyone. You get my point? You see why God says no sex until you're married? And guys, can I talk a little? Because we're talking about this. I may have to change the title. Do you mind? I may have to change the title. If you don't mind, I'll open up to this. Uh, because here. Guys, can I show you? Have you noticed in the scriptures, covenants are ratified and sealed by blood? The new covenant of Jesus was sealed by his blood. It was inaugurated by his blood. 
The Mosaic Covenant was, was inaugurated, ratified, sealed by the blood of, of bulls and goats. Exodus 24, 3 to 8, right? Even the Abrahamic Covenant, even the Abrahamic Covenant, circumcision of the foreskin, that, that's blood, ratified by blood, right? Ratified by blood, correct? King of kings, I know, I know, brother. Believe me, 10 years, and I'm not exaggerating. God is listening, King of Kings, if I'm lying. And I lost my testimony, King of Kings. When I would get abused, then I would lose my control, and I'd act in the flesh, and then I would hurl insults too to my shame. That's why the Lord allowed me to get out of this. He saved me from it. Okay, do you notice covenants? Covenants, they're all ratified by blood? Yes, Riaz Qureshi. What about it? Have you read Genesis 8, 20 to 21? I know you're not asking to challenge me because I don't want to then expose you. Genesis 8, 20 to 21, Rias. Let's read it. Smart Alec. Genesis 8, 20 to 21. Let's look at it. Yeah, it was, June. And Noah built an altar unto Jehovah and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Jehovah smelled the sweet savor, and Jehovah the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every li uh, everything living as I have done. Did that satisfy you, smart Alec? Thought he got me. I got you, Sam. In your dreams, baby. In your dreams, sucker. Yeah, yeah. Gee, I wonder why you're thinking about the rainbow, huh? Hmm? Anyway. Potato, Abdul, potato. <laughs> All right. Let's come back to the issue. So you see covenants are ratified by blood, right? And not just circumcision with Abraham. If you go to Genesis 15 and you read 12 to 16, actually 12 to 21, Abraham, Abraham sees a vision in which he sees birds and animals cut in pieces and smoke coming up. And that ratified the covenant between God and Abraham at that time called Abraham. Genesis 15, 12 to 21, right? So you're seeing everything has some, includes blood in it. Everything? All right. Even the covenant of marriage is supposed to be sealed by blood. The blood of your virgin wife. You understand what I just said? I can't get graphic. And yet, in today's society, that has been done away with. There is no blood that seals that union. Right? Coincidence? Even the marital covenant was designed to be sealed by blood. Dominus, do I need to really break, break, uh, break it down, brother? Come on, man. I'm trying to keep it G-rated. Not the menstrual blood. Oh, my goodness, dude. Are you guys serious? <laughs> Do I need to really? I'm trying to keep it G-rated, man. When you marry a woman who's a virgin, no man touched her, what happens? Milk comes out. Lemonade. Hello. Right. You understand? Is Do you understand now? Yeah, man. I mean, Johnny Torch, I got to teach you the birds and the bees. Let me tell you about the birds and the bees and the flowers and the tree. Now, Ian, I can't repeat what you just po posted in text. It's got to be G-rated, bro. Right? Is that a coincidence? God could have designed that union, Right? And I'm going to use medical terms, right? Opening up the hymen, right? Can I say that? Is that G-rated? Opening up the hymen? Right? I'm trying to use it in medical terms. You open the hymen. God could have done it where there would be no bleeding. Why do you think there's blood? God designed it because everything ratified by blood and blood represents life. Isn't it a tra travesty that today you can pretty much forget that? 
By the time you get married, that's gone. There's none. Right? Isn't it sad, the time we live in? Notice the hypocrisy, by the way. Notice the hypocrisy. Let me let me show you the hypocrisy. They'll tell you that <clears throat> teenagers, too young to get married. They're not responsible enough. So you got to go to school, get a degree, be financially well off. And then when you're in late 20s, early 30s, then you're mature enough to get married. But they will then say, to those same teenagers that they're mature and responsible enough to engage in premarital sex. If they're mature and responsible enough to engage in premarital sex, then they're also mature and responsible enough to then take the responsibility of caring for a wife and caring for children. You see the hypocrisy there? If you're telling me they're not mature enough and responsible enough to start a family and get married that young, then they're not mature enough and responsible enough to engage in sex. Why the hypocrisy and the inconsistency? Right? Anyway, with that said, we're 55 minutes into the discussion. Let's now get back to Adam as a type of Christ. Again, if the Holy Spirit guides the conversation, then he'll bless these sessions. He will blow us away. He will cause us to stand in awe of the Bible and how God has designed the nature of things. To build our confidence, the Bible is God's word. The God of the Bible is real, and Jesus is alive, and he'll never leave nor forsake us. Right? Now, let's talk about foreshadowings of Christ. This is going to blow you away. Let's go back to Romans 5.14. And I hope the Lord blessed me to speak truth without error and gave appropriate analogies and examples to illustrate the truth of Scripture. I know some of you were blown away by that, right? When I said blood, even the, the marital covenant is ratified by blood. But it's true, isn't it? Now that you see it from that perspective. Because God could have designed it in another way where, you know, anyway. Romans 5, 14, let's read. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who's the figure of him that was to come. Now, first last, can you post... Modern English version or ESV? Not because I want to ban the King James. I love it. To me, it's the perfect word of God in English. But again, I want you to see what God says about Adam. Okay, guys, pay attention. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Did you catch it? God is telling you in the Bible, Adam is a picture of Christ. Adam points to Christ. He's a type, a shadow of Christ who's a reality. Right? Do you see that? Do everyone see? Adam points to Jesus. He's a picture of Christ. Everyone got that? You got it? You sure? Because if you got it, now you're going to be blown away. In the first place, let me show you places where water becomes a symbol of the Holy Spirit, a picture of the Holy Spirit. John 7, 38 to 39. Get ready now. Now you're going to get blown away. John 7, 38 to 39. And then I'll open up the Skype where you can call in with questions. So we just got to be patient, and God willing, we'll, the stream will be less, right? And we won't have problems with uh, buffering. What happened here? All right. John 7, 38, 39. Guys, watch here. Water becomes a symbol of the Holy Spirit. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Did you catch it? Water points to the Holy Spirit. Water becomes a symbol of the Holy Spirit, right? Do you see that right there? When Jesus said, if you believe in him, you'll have springs of living water bubbling up within you. John says, those living waters, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, waters. Waters, Holy Spirit. Waters, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is water. Okay, right? The Bible also likens, the Bible also likens our birth in our mother's womb as being formed from the dust of the earth. The Bible likens your conception in your mother's womb as God fashioning you from the earth, right? F from, from the womb of the earth, from the womb of the world. 
Now, do me a favor, first last. Use either ESV or modern English version. Psalm 139, 13 to 16. Follow with me, guys. And I don't want you to think I'm bad in King James. I do love the King James. To me, it's the perfect words of God in English. That's my conviction. But for those who may have a hard time with Shakespeare in English, I want you to get this. Psalm 139, 13 to 16. Guys, pay attention. Your conception of your mother's womb is likened to you being formed by God out of the womb of the earth. From, from the earth. Watch. For you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So you knit me in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricate, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Did you catch it? His mother's womb is now likened to the earth. I was fashioned in my mother's womb. I was intricately woven from the depths of the earth. So my mother's womb is my earth. That's the earth I came out of. That's the earth I came out from. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were in every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Did you catch it? Water becomes a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Being formed in the mother's womb is being fashioned from the earth. Coming out of the earth, from the earth. You guys caught it? Amen, Christos and Esti. Do you guys see that? I don't know. Did Love Sam say so, she's Samara? Samara Shimon? Is that who you said you were? No, right? Because I'm confused. Anyway, everyone got it, right? You're not Samara? All right. Okay, now if you got it, Holy Spirit is often symbolized by water. Water represents Holy Spirit. Being fashioned in your mother's womb is likened to being formed out of the earth. Okay, now let's go to Luke. Luke 1, 34, 35. I know. Is this Samara that I know? Is that you, Surata Dian? Because I only know one Samara. Luke 1, 34 and 35. And Mary said to the angel, oh, okay, because I know a Samara too. That's where you confuse me. Guys, pay attention. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? God bless you, Timothy. Lord bless you. How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So notice, Mary is a virgin. Her womb is, vir uh, is virgin womb. No man touched her. Holy Spirit came upon her. She conceived the Lord Jesus Christ while a virgin. So Jesus came out of virgin soil, virgin earth, virgin ground that was watered by the Holy Spirit, right? Let me repeat. Jesus came out of virgin soil, virgin ground, virgin earth that no man had toiled, watered by the Holy Spirit, right? Matthew 1, 18 and 20. Matthew 1, 18 and 20. Guys, pay attention. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before life they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So she conceived by the Holy Spirit. No man had touched her physically, sexually. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So notice, Mary's womb is virgin earth, virgin ground, virgin soil. No man had touched it, and she conceived when her womb was watered by the Holy Spirit. Because remember, water is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, right? You got it so far? And first, last, and the rest, you know where I'm going with this. If you got it, how is Adam a picture of Jesus? Louisa, here's where I need you all to pay attention, at least included. Genesis 2, verses 4 to 7, because I've already discussed this in the past. So if you've been with me for a while, you know where I'm going with this, because I've done this in previous sessions. Genesis 2, verses 4 to 7. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord Jehovah God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For Jehovah God, the Lord God, had not caused it to rain 
on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then Jehovah, the Lord God, formed a man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature, a living soul. Did you catch it? The earth from which Adam came, no man had touched. It was virgin soil. And God only fashioned Adam when it was watered. A mist watered it. So Adam, like Jesus, was born of a virgin. Virgin soil, virgin ground that was watered. No man having touched it. Adam was conceived and born from a virgin as the last, the second Adam was. Let it sink in. I'm going to give you a minute to sink in. Let it sink in. You got it? You got it? All right. I don't know what you mean I'm lost trying to connect. I have no idea what that means. The ground from which Adam came out was virgin ground. No man touched it. But before God fashioned Adam from the ground, he watered it, a mist. Water is often a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Jesus came out of a virgin womb watered by the Holy Spirit. Right? You so, so far, are you with me or no? Because we're going to go to the second point. Now, how did Jesus get his bride? Because the church is the bride of Christ, right? Ephesians 5. Yeah, let's read it. Ephesians 5, 26. Do I want to read all of it? Yeah, let's read Ephesians 5, 26 to 33. And God, yeah, I need, we need to read all of it. Ephesians 5, 25 to 33, not 26. Ephesians 5, 25 to 33. I'm sorry. Okay, watch here. Watch here. Yeah, we got to read all of it because he quotes Genesis 2, 24. Okay, watch here. Ephesians 5, 25 to 33. But it's not just Christ and the church. It's also a quotation of Genesis 2, 24. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Now notice, he quotes Genesis 2.24, which is about Adam and Eve. Genesis 2.24 is about Adam and Eve becoming one flesh, coming together. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So notice, Adam and Eve, Genesis 24, refer to Christ and the church. Adam, Eve, Christ, and the church, meaning Adam points to Christ and Eve points to the church. Church, the church is the Eve of Christ. Are you seeing it or no? This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it ref refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Do you guys catch it? Do you catch it, right? Adam, picture of Christ, who's the last Adam. Eve, a picture of the church, which is the Eve to Christ. So Genesis 2.24 is about Adam and Eve coming together to become one flesh. Paul says that's actually pointing to Christ, a greater reality, a greater union, a greater mystery. Okay. So the church is the bride of Christ. It's the Eve to Christ who is the Adam that came after the first Adam. Right? Everyone got it? Now, how did Christ... <clears throat> Receive his bride. Well, Ephesians 5, 26. Let's look at it one more time. Wait, where, you see where I'm going with this. Ephesians 5, 26. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. So the word, the gospel, cleanses us like water. Right? So this is talking about spiritual purification. So the word is like water that cleansed us spiritually. Now, 
Let's go to John 19 and read 30 to 35. The key verse is going to be 34. So I got to go, we got to walk you through this slowly. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, right? And that they might be taken away. So the shoulders came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. So notice, when Jesus died, they, they cut his side open, pierced his side open. So they cut his side open, right? Don't forget, 34. And what came out of his side? Blood and water. Now I'm going to tell you what blood and water represents in a minute. What does blood and water coming out of Jesus' side that had been cut open after he died? Watch. Okay, blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth that you also may believe. The blood that came out of Jesus' side and the water that came out of Jesus' side. What does that rep represent? 1 John 1.7. 1 John 1.7. For John 1 7. Okay. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood coming out of Jesus' side points to his death on our behalf to forgive us of our sins so that we can stand in God's presence and be worthy to stand in his presence. If the blood of Jesus doesn't cleanse you, you cannot have fellowship with God or one another. The blood of Jesus has to cleanse you of your sin in order for you then to have fellowship with God and walk worthy of God, right? But then take it a further step. Water came out, not just blood. Blood and water came out. Why the water? You already know what the water is. John 7, 38 to 39, right? What is the water? Let's see what the water is. Let's see what the water is. John 7, 38 to 39. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So notice, the death of Christ brings about the cleansing of sin and the new birth. If Jesus didn't die... You would not be forgiven your sins, and you would not receive the Holy Spirit of life. It is his death that results in you being forgiven and being born of the Spirit. You need to be forgiven and born of the Spirit to be one with Christ, part of his spiritual body, to be his bride. If you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. You're not his spiritual body. You're not his bride. If you're not washed in the blood, you're not forgiven, and you don't belong to Christ. Okay? Let's go to Romans 8. Verses 9 to 10. Romans 8, verses 9 to 10. Wait, we're, we're not there yet. Romans 8, 9 to 10. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So if you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, although the body's dead because of sin, your body's dying, the effects of sin... The spirit is light because of righteousness. So notice, you need the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God in you, or you don't belong to Christ. You need the blood of Jesus to wash you, or you don't belong to Christ. So water represents, symbolizes the spirit giving you new birth, washing you in the blood of Jesus, and uniting you to Christ, making you one with Christ, and part of his spiritual body, and becoming his bride. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Yes, Christos NSD. John 3, 5 to 6, which we'll look at again. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And I'll do a session on John 3, 5. What does it mean to be born of water and spirit? For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. The spirit takes you and unites you to the spiritual body of Christ, becoming his church, his bride. 
You don't have the spirit, you're not part of his body. Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. John 3, verses 5 to 6. John 3, verses 5 to 6. Jesus answered, truly, 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 I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of this flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus' death and his side being cut open and blood and water coming out points to the death of Christ procure, procuring the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If Christ did not die for you, and if you don't trust in Christ, you won't be forgiven. You won't receive the Holy Spirit. So Jesus died to procure your forgiveness and that you'd be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? And death in the Bible is often called sleeping. When someone dies, the Bible says he's asleep. John 11, verses 11 to 15. John 11, verses 11 to 15. Watch where I'm going with this. Please don't call me Sham because I take that as an insult. Sam. John 11, verse 11 to 15. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I go to awaken him, wake him up from asleep. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. They took it literally. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So notice again, death is described as sleep. Jesus was put to sleep. When he died, he was put to sleep because when you sleep, you know you're going to wake. And he awoke on the third day. But when he was asleep dead, his side was cut open and the blood and water came out, which are the basis for the birth of his bride, the church. Right? So Jesus had to be put to sleep, has, have his side cut open, in order for his church to be born, his bride to be formed. Right? Right? If Jesus wasn't put to death, didn't sleep, and his side wasn't cut open, his bride would not be formed, his bride would not be born. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 to 23. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, 23. Now everyone, it clicked, right? Click. So Jehovah the Lord caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that Jehovah God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man, then the man said, this is at last, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. <laughs> the first Adam was put to sleep and his side was cut open and his wife was fashioned. The second Adam, last Adam, was put to sleep and his side was open. Blood and water came up, which is the basis that resulted in his bride being formed and coming into being. You're shaking. Let me give you a minute for it to sink in. Let me give you a minute for it to sink in. I don't want to move on. She goes, oh, gosh, I'm shaking. You guys are all blown away, huh? Thank you, Lisa. God bless you. Thank you. Oh, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. This is nothing yet. Now let's look at Genesis 2, 23, 24 one more time to see what Paul was quoting from. Amen, Timothy. Genesis 2, 23 to 24. Then the man said, this is at last bone, bone of my bones because she came out of my body. She came from my bones and she was made from my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Woman, by the way, and that's 324. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Woman, if you trace the origin of woman, it means womb of man. 
womb of man. So woman means womb of man. She came out of the womb of man. In Hebrew, the in Hebrew it says, she shall be called Isha because she came out of Ish. Adam is Ish. She's Isha because she came out of Ish. So she has the same nature I do. She has the same dignity I do, the same value I do, and the same honor that I, I have. Because she is from me, so she has the same nature I do, the same equality in nature and essence and glory and honor. So she's called Isha because she came from Ish. In English, woman means womb of man. She came out of the womb of man, so she's called woman. In Hebrew, she's called Isha because she came from Ish. Right? So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. If woman came out of the very human body, the physical body, the human nature of man, because he says, you came out of my bones, you're bone of my bones. You're made from my flesh. How can anyone say that the Bible says women are inferior to men in essence, in dignity, in value, in honor, and glory, when she comes out of man, she came out of his bones, so she's bone from his bones, flesh of his flesh. How can she be inferior to man when she comes from man, was made from the same essence and substance and body of man? Let me muzzle the filthy dog. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. Satan always distracts me. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So you see it so far with me? You're with me so far, right? All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Satan always attacks. So making sense? Now let's look at the citation from Paul. Now this time, first last, either quote modern English version or the King James. Now let's relook at Ephesians 5 again. We're going to read 30 to 32. Amen. James 4 to verse 8. Ephesians 5, 30 to 32. No, it didn't buff. Was it buffing? That was a while back. It was good. I stopped because I had to get rid of a dog of Satan. Ephesians 5, 30 to 32. Guys, read. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Wait, 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 wait. Paul said, you believers are members of Jesus' body. You are the flesh of Jesus and the bones of Jesus. And then he says, for this cause shall a man, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. Did you catch it? Paul tells you Genesis 2 is all about Christ and the church. The way God fashioned Eve to be Adam's wife, to be one flesh with him, was deliberately designed to be a picture of Christ and the church. Now, where did Eve get her name from? She was called woman because she came out of the womb of man, right? In Hebrew, she's called Isha because she came out of Ish, right? Right? You with me there? So she's called woman because she's from the womb of man. Man, womb, man. Ish in Hebrew, Isha. But now Paul said, Adam and Eve are a picture of Christ and the church. When it says the two will become one flesh, that's a picture of Christ and the church. Because we are flesh from his flesh, bone of his bone, right? No wonder you're called Christian. Because from Christ you come, so you're called Christian. 1 Peter 4.16 Hmm. So you bear the very name of the one from whom you sprung forth. Just like Eve sprung forth from man, she's called woman. She sprung forth from Ish, she's called Isha. 1 Peter 4.16 Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Oh, you're called woman because you're from the womb of man. Woman, man. Isha, Ish. I'm Christian because I'm from Christ. I'm flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone, one with him in the spirit.
Yes, Christos NST. It's all points to Christ. Isn't sinking in? Or no? Hold on, guys. I'm looking for something. Is it sinking in? Okay. Now, Adam and Eve were in a garden, right? Adam and Eve were in a garden. Let's go to Genesis 3. Let's read Genesis 3, 20 to 24, and chapter 4, verse 1. We're almost done, folks. If you guys, if you're bored, I'll stop now. Because we're just warming up. Genesis 3, 20 to 24. Okay. Watch here. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. Right? Chava. Right? Chava. Because she was the mother of all living. Now watch this. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord Jehovah God said, Behold the man. And the Lord Jehovah God, Jehovah God said, Behold the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now let lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God, Jehovah God, Yehovah God, sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So Adam and Eve were in a garden. They were now thrown out of the garden. Now Genesis 4 verse 1. I'll block this guy. Send him out of here. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from Jehovah. Now, guys, do you pay attention? While Eve was in the garden, she was a virgin, right? They hadn't had sex. She was a virgin, right? You with me there or no? Because notice when did they have sex? After they were thrown out, Genesis 4.1. But I don't think you get it now, right? Now let's go to Genesis 3.17. What did God call her in the garden? What was her name in the garden? Genesis 3, 17. Look what God says to, to Adam about her. And, and to Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and has eaten. Okay, so that's his wife. What was her name? What was her name in the garden? Okay, let's go to Genesis 3. Let's read. Verses 3, I'm sorry, 9, all the way to 16. Genesis 3, 9 to 16. No, her name wasn't Eve. She wasn't called Eve until she sinned. And Jehovah called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman... Her name was woman. The woman, okay, whom thou gavest to me, to be with me, she gave me of the tree, of, and I did eat. And Jehovah God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Okay. And Jehovah God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So what was her name? Woman. She was a woman. In a garden who was a virgin, who ate fruit from a forbidden tree and brought death. A woman in a garden who was a virgin. A virgin woman ate forbidden fruit from a tree that was forbidden and brought death. Another virgin woman gave birth. And from her fruit, the fruit of a womb, hung on the tree that if you eat of that tree, you will receive life. Luke 1. 42. Luke 1, 42. Luke 1, 42. And she spake out loud with a voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus is the fruit of Mary's womb, a virgin woman who gave birth to fruit. But this fruit hung on a tree. Acts 5, verse 30. Acts 5, verse 30. Watch, guys. 
Acts 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. So Jesus hung on a tree and died. And that was the fruit of the virgin woman, Mary. Acts 10, 39. Acts 10, 39. Acts 10, 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of Jews and Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Jesus hung on a tree. So the cross is a tree. The cross is a tree. It's the tree of life. <whistles> Acts 13, 29. Acts 13, 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. Sepulchre. I can't always have a time pronouncing that. Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13. The Holy Spirit is great. The triumph God is great. Anything great for me is from him. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So Jesus hung on a tree to take our curse and punishment. 1 Peter 2, 24. 1 Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Jesus, the fruit of the virgin woman, hanging on a tree. Go to John 19, 25 to 27. John 19, 25, 27. Who's at the cross? Now there stood by the cross, which is Jesus' tree, the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and disciples standing by whom he loved, the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Woman, behold thy son. <whistles> then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Jesus is on the cross, the fruit of the woman hanging on a tree. There's the woman and her son, her seed, a believer. Oh, but you don't get it. Galatians, uh, Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. And Jehovah, God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. And thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now notice 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. The woman and her children. I'll put hatred between the woman and the children. Your children and her children. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Is it a coincidence that Jesus is the seed of the woman hanging on the tree? And then he says, woman, here's your other seed, your other son believers so here's the woman and the seed and her seed is on the cross the tree of life the fruit of her womb and this is the tree that is per permitted to us to eat the fruit thereof to be saved okay let me break it down a virgin woman ate forbidden fruit from a forbidden tree and brought death a virgin woman gave birth to fruit hanging on a tree which tree you're allowed to touch and whose fruit you're allowed to eat as the remedy of death. You catching it or no? Before I move on. Right? I don't know why you put two. You catching it? Okay. Now, Death entered the world in a garden, right? Death entered the world in a garden, right? Because it was in the garden that they ate the forbidden tree and died, right? 
Okay, John 19, 40 to 42. John 19, 40 to 42. John 19, 40 to 42. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb, sepulchre, where, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid, there laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. Jesus is buried in a tomb in a garden. And so when Jesus rose from the dead and destroyed death, death was destroyed in a garden. Death entered the world in a garden. The destruction of death took place in a garden. John 20, 11 to 17. John 20, 11 to 17. John 20, 11 to 17. But Mary stood without the, at the sepulchre weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, which is in a garden. And see it, two angels in while sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet. So notice two angels, spirit creatures, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, woman. Oh, there's that word again. Woman. Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and did not know it was Jesus. She didn't recognize him. Jesus saith unto her, woman. There's that word woman again. Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She's supposing him to be the gardener. Gardener. Adam was a gardener. Adam was created to till the ground, to be a gardener in a garden. And she thought Jesus was a gardener. <whistles> Say unto them, sir, if thou have borne him, have you taken him hence? Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not. I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, unto my God and your God. Now, don't let the English translation confuse you. She was touching him. Put the SV for me, first and last. John 20, verse 17. John 20, verse 17. She was touching him. She was clinging on to him. But Jesus is saying, you don't need to be clinging on to me so desperately. You can let me go for now. So Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. He only quoted a part of the verse. Okay, you see what he's saying? She was touching him, but she was clinging. She didn't want to let go. He's saying, don't be afraid. You can let me go. You don't need to cling to me. Now let's tie it in. Like the Garden of Eden, a woman touched a forbidden tree and ate forbidden fruit and brought death. Then you had cherubim, spirit creatures, guarding the garden, banishing her and Adam from ever touching the tree of life. Genesis 3, 21 to 24. We saw it first and last. Don't worry about it. Genesis 3, 21 to 24. Watch here. Oh, we're almost done, folks. And Jehovah God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then Jehovah the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, like one of us, in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. I don't want them to touch the tree of life. Therefore the Lord God, Jehovah God, sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east, of the Garden of Eden, placed the cherubim. That's two, two cherubim, two spirit creatures, and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, hmm, Jesus is laid in a tomb in a garden. Death entered the world in a garden. The destruction of death took place in a garden, Jesus' resurrection. In the garden, you had two spirit creatures, angels. In the Garden of Eden, there were two spirit creatures, cherubim which would not allow them to touch the tree of life. But in Jesus' garden, the two angels are there and do not stop Mary from touching the tree of life, Jesus Christ, the fruit that hung on the tree, making his cross the tree of life. She was allowed to enter the garden and touch him.
I'm just pausing for you guys to digest this. And you notice the angels and Jesus called her woman and she thought he was a gardener. Why? Because the first Adam was a gardener created to take care of the Garden of Eden. Your mother ain't real, brah, because you're a filthy dog. Worse than a dog, you filth of the earth. Brah, saw Jesus like that and saw your mother for giving birth to an animal like you. Don't ever insult Jesus. Thomas, you, I've been dying to block you because you're asking me why wouldn't God allow it? So you want God to allow them to eat the tree of life and corruptible sinful bodies so they can live forever in rebellion to God. You're killing me, Thomas. Instead of focusing on the connection to Jesus, you're more concerned about that. I think that you're going to get plagued with the coronavirus and be another victim of it. Everyone with me there? That, that's for Lily Oaks. Talking about Jesus, she's talking about a stupid virus. Okay, everyone with me there? Did you get the connections or do I need to go over it again? A virgin woman in a garden eats fruit from a forbidden tree, so it's Touches a forbidden tree, and death <clears throat> enters the world in a garden. Another virgin woman bears fruit, the fruit of her womb. That fruit hangs on the tree, making the tree of life that you're supposed to eat, touch, and eat from in order to destroy death, remedy death. And Jesus was buried in a garden, and so the destruction of death took place in a garden, just like death entered the world in a garden. But this time, a woman is allowed to be in that garden and touch the tree of life and the fruit of that tree, Jesus Christ. And there are two spirit creatures in that garden, like there are two spirit creatures banishing Adam and Eve from entering the garden, teach, touching the tree of life. I still love you, Truth Yao, but not too much. Everyone with me there? So let's end it now. Let's end it with another picture of the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's end it. And I'll open up the Q&A tomorrow. I have a debate tomorrow, God willing. Pray I'll be filled with the Spirit. Pray I'll control myself, not to lose my temper and control, but to be controlled, self-constrained for the glory of Christ and decimate, destroy that blasphemous agent of the devil and his blasphemies for the glory of Jesus. Hopefully he'll repent. If not, to shame him, to never blaspheme Jesus Christ. I'll get you the link in a minute. Okay. You ready now? Let me show you another picture of Christ. Isaiah 37, 22. Wait, Lisa, I'll get you the link. Don't lose focus. Focus on this. Isaiah 37, 22. Okay, watch. Another picture of Christ. Guys, pay attention now. Isaiah 37, 22. This is the word that Jehovah has spoken concerning him. She despises you. She scorns you. The virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Now notice, God calls the inhabitants of Jerusalem. God calls the inhabitants of Judah, the virgin daughter of Zion, a holy hell in Jerusalem, the virgin daughter of Judah, the virgin daughter of Jerusalem. So notice, right, the imagery. Okay. The inhabitants of Jerusalem, the inhabitants of Zion, the inhabitants of Judah are called the virgin daughter of Judah, of Zion, of Jerusalem. Lamentations 1, 15. Lamentations 1, 15. Lamentations 1, 15. The Lord rejected all my mighty men. In my midst, he summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a wine press the virgin daughter of Judah. So inhabitants of Judah are called the virgin daughter of Judah. So he punishes the virgin daughter of Judah, the virgin daughter of Zion, the virgin daughter of Jerusalem. Lamentations 2.13. Lamentations 2.13. Watch.
What can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can know you? Virgin daughter of Judah, virgin daughter of Jerusalem, virgin daughter of Zion. What does God say? What is he going to do for the daughter of Zion, the daughter of Jerusalem, the daughter of Judah? Let's go to Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3, verses 4, 14 to 17. Zephaniah 3, verses 14 to 17. Almost done. And I'm exhausted, man. Woo. Now but watch what's going to happen. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O, o Israel. Rejoice and exult. Rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Jehovah has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord Jehovah, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. So Jehovah is going to be in your midst, O virgin daughter of Jerusalem. Jehovah is going to be in your midst, O virgin daughter of Zion. Jehovah is going to be in your midst, O virgin daughter of Judah. On that day it shall be said of Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. Jehovah, the Lord your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with, by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. So God is going to sing lungs, love songs over you. He's going to sing for you. He's going to sing love songs showing how much he loves you. Okay. Zechariah 2, 10 to 12. Zechariah 2, 10 to 12. Zechariah 2, 10 to 12. Watch. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I will come and I will dwell in your midst, declares Jehovah. And many nations shall join themselves to Jehovah in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. And you shall know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me. And Jehovah will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. So Jehovah, God, will come to dwell in the midst of the virgin daughter of Zion, the virgin daughter of Judah, the virgin daughter of Jerusalem. He will dwell in her midst and be with her. Luke 1, 28. Luke 1, 28. Luke 1, 28. Speaking to Mary. This year first last, before the rapture. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Mary, the Lord is with you. Luke 1, 34, 35. Luke 1, 34, 35, loser. My goodness. Luke 1, 34, 35. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So wait, Mary is the virgin daughter of Judah, the virgin daughter of Jerusalem, the virgin daughter of Zion, and the Lord was with her and in her and came out from her midst. Came out from her midst. Luke 143. Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. What does she say to Mary? Luke 143. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So Mary is literally, physically, the virgin daughter of Judah, the virgin daughter of Zion. The virgin daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord was with her and actually entered her and dwelt in her and took a physical body from her and came out of her midst. Came out of her midst. Let me get you the link for my debate tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll do a Q&A after the debate, God willing. By the power of the triumph God, I will decimate that person and expose him as a liar that he is. With the hopes he'll repent. If not, then he'll be shamed and discredited to never blaspheme the triumph God. Pray I do it with boldness, passion, but gently. So he doesn't use an excuse. Oh, I was mean. Right? Let me get you the link and we're done. Because I can't, I would take Q&A, but I am exhausted, friends. I'm not the young man I used to be. Hold on, guys. Let me find it. Let's get it.
Pray for it. Pray and join us. Let me get you the link. Why can't I find it, man? Not able to find it. Where's the link? Sorry, folks. Hold on. When I want to find it, I can't. Oh, boy. Anyway, I think it's on Debate TV. Debate TV. All right. I know what to do. His name is Marlon Wilson. All right, folks, for the delay. Why can't I find it, dude? Okay. All right. The Gospel Truth and Andrew Griffin. Here you go. There it goes. The Gospel Truth and Andrew Griffin. Hopefully I'm going to silence this demon, this human demon, son of Satan, for the glory of Jesus Christ. But I'll do it boldly but lovingly. He even looks like a demon. It's tomorrow. Okay, here you go, guys. Click on it. Pray for tomorrow. I'll be spirit-filled and just expose this gentleman, this agent of the devil, for the glory of Jesus Christ. And afterwards I'll do a Q&A. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. May he keep us safe and sound and provide for us. And give us the grace not to shame him but to overcome this panic and honor him and love him and trust him and be a light shining for the glory of Jesus so that others will come. Pray for my health, my daughter's health. Pray for one another. Pray for the provisions for all of us that we keep doing this for the glory of Christ. So I'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing.